I go. I'm Amanda Krugliak. I'm the arts curator at the University of Michigan Institute for the Humanities Gallery in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I'm also the curator of our project, Daisy Chain. Daisy Chain references that beautiful garland of flowers that we used to make as children. It's also a term in electrical engineering about the unique combinations of things, one to another. And for me, it's a, a look back and also thinking about the future. How do we move forward? We've all been through this extraordinary time going through things personally and also together. The project is about presenting artists' ideas as well as their work. Artists have always had the ability to help us through challenging times, to help us to process something, to feel our way through it. The nine artists chosen include emerging artists, established artists, artists at different points in their career. And they're also people that have really bold ideas and unique perspectives. Conceptually, my hope with Daisy Chain is we could just let everything fall away, get rid of the facade or pretense or all the rhetoric and get to something closer to the heart of the matter through these questions and images. Hello, I'm Shawnee Peters. I am an artist and an educator. Uh, I have an individual practice and I am also co-director of the Black School, uh, which is an experimental art school in which we pair Black radical history with public art making. I am currently a resident of New Orleans, Louisiana. I uh, recently um, relocated here from New York City with my partner and husband, Joseph Couillet, who also co-directs the Black School with me. We're working to, to build a physical home for the Black School here in New Orleans. My name is Jeffrey Augustin Sonko, and I'm an artist, and I'm based in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I do a lot of self-portraiture work, and so I multiply myself as well. And so within the worlds that I create, there happens to only be me. Um, and I play different roles, but essentially what you're seeing um, and experiencing are multiple Jeffreys. My name is Hubert Massey. I'm a fresco muralist artist. I make monumental pieces of artwork to impact communities, to celebrate communities, and just to tell the stories. Uh, I've been in the city of Detroit for almost uh, oh, a little bit over 40 years. Uh, I'm originally from Flint, so I'm a transplant. Hi, I'm Shane Almoni. Um, I'm based in Providence, Rhode Island. I would call myself a multidisciplinary artist, but my primary field is photography. I make sculptural tableaus that are political in content and mine and excavate political histories that are oft forgotten by the West and also think about current political affairs and events and how they are entrenched and entangled in the histories that came before them. My name is David Updike. I'm an artist. I've been in New York City for about 25 years now. The kind of work I'm making right now started when I was looking for sort of vintage postcards from the early 20th century. You can see a whole bunch of them in this large arrangement behind me. And what really appeals to me about them is that these postcards from like 1905 to 1940 have a baked in kind of American exceptionalism and boosterism and capitalism and develop and all these things that are great until they run out of control and run everything into the ground. My name is Ruth Winteo. I am an artist and I live in San Antonio, Texas. I create interdisciplinary work that deals with identity, relationships, family, memory. Lately, I've been working in new media, working with photography and uh, printed acrylics. My name is Abigail DeVille. I'm a visual artist. I make work responsive to history and to kind of make spaces in which we can travel to the past and think about potential futures through assemblage, using lots of found local materials. I do many site-specific installations and sometimes uh, performance and costumes. 
and I am currently living in New Jersey. Wow, you moved because I thought you were in the Bronx still, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, I don't ever even tell anybody about the New Jersey thing. It's like, <laughs> it's like, shh. My name is Shanna Marola. I'm an artist, teacher, and legal worker, and I live in Hamtramck, Michigan. Uh, most of my work is in Detroit. I work interdisciplinary. I don't know. I use photography, but the photography becomes sculptural, and I work in collaboration with activist-led art groups, and for quite a while now, I've been working on different series about environmental justice and climate change and this is my home studio in Hamtramck. I'm Scott Northrup. I'm a visual artist, uh, filmmaker, and educator. I am uh, the associate professor and chair of photography and film at CCS, College of Creative Studies. I live in Dearborn. I work in Detroit. And my studio, where I am right now, is in Hamtramck. OK, so first question. How do you feel you are emerging for the past year? Um, I feel like I'm not ready to see the world yet. <laughs> you know, on one quick level, I'm very happy to stay home all the time and just be present, uh, you know, with myself and my partner and our little dog. I mean, I'm very excited to get so, back out into the rest of the world because we've been, you know, very, very isolated, just like everyone else for so long. And it just sort of, it reminds you, it reminds you of a couple of things, of all the people that you kind of are okay with being around, which you don't need anymore. And of all the people that you can't believe that you missed out on opportunities to spend time with before this, and now it's been two, three, four years instead of, is uh, reminds you of how important it is to be, you know, to stay in touch with and be around actual people and actual friends. The pandemic the past year has also been a huge cultural and social shift. But for someone as like myself, who, uh, you know, is an AAPI person, a gay person, someone who's conscious of what's happening in our society today, it wasn't so much a shift rather than the unveiling of something that has already been happening. And I believe that a lot of that is already, has been present in my work for a very long time. And so I think emerging out of this has simply been me being able to share my experiences with people in a way that felt relevant. Because of what happened last May 25th with George Floyd and then um, Breonna Taylor was before that, but because of the heightened attention around him, then, you know, Ahmaud Aubrey, you know, came forward. And so all of these kinds of uh, state sanctioned deaths or murders started moving to the fore. And I feel like the art world was uh, scrambling to show their alliance or allegiance to Black Lives Matter when... You know, I'd say before last summer, and people were still on the fence about that, right? There was a, definitely a lull period for me where I wasn't getting that many opportunities. And then all of a sudden it was kind of like, um, you know, just like a, I don't know, uh, I'll, I'll say like a rush or like a flood of opportunities just coming my way. And I feel that has been true for a lot of like artists, comrades who also make work in similar veins. So, um, so it's, it's been like the best of times and the worst of times. And I think just the kind of like pandemonium that everyone was feeling and not knowing and not feeling sure about answers. I, I think people became a little bit more selfish. So I'm kind of emerging out of this year thinking about, you know, okay, now everyone, whether they are like, you know, from the upper class or lower, has felt fear in some way, shape or form. The fear is not equal in any way, shape or form, though, across classes. But is that fear something that could begin a conversation about, you know, the other ways or the other types of traumas individuals fear uh, or feel on a daily basis?
in regards to other issues and other inequities. I've been sort of isolated anyway because I'm an artist, right? Uh, I work in my studio. I create a lot of drawings and all. And it hasn't really affected me uh, a, a whole lot. I, I really don't get out in the uh, public per se a whole lot. So I'm mostly concentrating on my uh, on my craft quite a bit. So, yeah. You know, believe it or not, I feel hopeful. I think that we have to feel hopeful. And something that I keep coming back to is two things. The um, movement for racial justice that happened globally after the murder of George Floyd a year ago. Um, and then also separately, the movement for like mutual aid and um, grassroots networks sort of coming together to take care of each other, whether that's during the pandemic or during protests on the street where police are being really heavy handed and injuring people, or whether it's a climate change induced you know, situation like we just saw in Texas. And I think that those two groundswells are really exciting to me because they're all about neighborhood and community self-determination. Well, the word emerge also is interesting because I was invited to do a project with the Museum of Lost Renewal in Italy, and then they invited me during the pandemic to contribute some text to a uh, blanket that they're making, a bespoke blanket to kind of comfort the world. And the words I gave were merge, emerge, remerge. And I've been thinking about that a lot lately. And then I, you mentioned that in an email, one of you did, and asking me that today about how I'm emerging. I don't know, <laughs> honestly. I think like, the anxiety I feel right now is like when we're merging, you know, this merging on the traffic and the cars are going so fast that you think you're, each time you're going to lose your life and you're not yeah, ready yeah. and you're trying to time it based on everybody else. That's how I feel. Like, right, that's the feeling I've had lately. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping now, now that we're, you know, re-entering that, I can start to respond. It's definitely going to be impacted by this past year. It just, for me, it's always kind of like a slower, I have a slower process of like absor absorbing and then having it kind of come out. I feel really good, um, but it's because it's been an exceptional year for me. I mean, it's been an exceptional year for everybody. Um, it started off very grim. We had a whole summer of programming planned uh, for summer 2020 in New Orleans um, that all got you know canceled in a week, just like everybody else. Um, had family issues, you know, all the things. And I was... Um, anxious that everything we've been working for would be stalled another two years or three years, right, um, because of everything that was happening. Minneapolis had just gone up in flames. People said, absolutely not, right? And then the next night, 25 other American cities were in protest against police brutality, against anti-Blackness in general. Um, and so I described already what the Black school does. So we we were already doing the kind of things that suddenly were like in the public interest. And so, yeah, we had two friends on the same day say, uh, say you all really need to get a Venmo link up. And so we did, and by the time we did it, you know, we put it up at 10 o'clock one night, and the next morning there was a thousand dollars there. And then of course, the fact that this good news for us comes on the backs of more dead black people, right? More videos of black men being murdered that we're repeating again and again and again and again, right? While black women being murdered doesn't even make the news, right? Like <laughs> the problems are plentiful um, and, and really complex, but the way this, this year has shaped up for me puts me in a position to, to be able to manage it all in a much more healthy way than, than I was able to a year ago.
what are you individually then taking from the experience? How do you think your approach has changed in regards to work in the studio or your life? I think like a lot of people right now, I don't want this past year to have been in vain, you know? You know, at some parts it felt like I was like living like a monk. I've kind of just I approach things differently. I'm a lot calmer. Um, things that normally would really stress me out, I, I know that it's going to be okay. And I feel like in terms of uh, the kinds of clarity that I've been able to have within the work or seeing new directions for myself, um, I, ca I don't want to give that up, even though, you know, there's, you know, events every day now. I think about the ways that the pandemic made structural structural inequality visible in some ways that it hasn't necessarily been before. So I'm thinking about that because a lot of my work focuses on things that are um, not super easy to make visible or tangible, you know, like extractive economies, privatization, austerity. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to just try and take... Uh, the human aspect of my personal art practice a little more, a little more, not seriously, that's not the right word, but just try and put more actual people into the projects that I'm doing, even if it's just sort of like the human presence has not been a large factor in the work that I've been doing. It's mostly been about places and things and events and technology. Maybe just sort of the fact that I'm yearning to be around actual people so I can paint them in there. <laughs> I think another strategy that I'm learning is to pace myself with the current events. Uh, this current installation that I have at the Mattress Factory certainly responded and was in preparation for the U.S. presidential election uh, in response to the last four years of administration. And there's always going to be something that uh, heightens uh our emotions and for me at least in the past year i've learned to sort of pay my, pace myself with what i'm essentially being critical of because i could be critical of a lot but i think being able to choose what i want and make those choices as to what i will be critical and what i'll touch upon within my work there's always another time there's always another artwork i can't pack everything in i can't pack all the meaning into one artwork um, because I personally will get exhausted and my message will get muddied. So I've learned to really edit uh, this past year. Even recognizing your capacity to adapt to different environments and the need to really do that, to not always just try to like bend and contort to whatever's happening, but to really think clearly about what's happening um, and what you're able to do and what you're not able to do in any given moment is a thing that uh, that I will definitely carry um, going forward. One of the things I, I did for myself, I said, I, I need to do one thing consistently every day. And so the one thing was first work, work on my health. So what I did was I rode a bike. I didn't ride a bike outside, I rode a bike inside, but I committed uh, 30 minutes to me to for my health and all. But I, I, I think a part of that uh, gives me an opportunity to not only refurbish myself uh, in a way that I can function at a much higher level, but uh, it, it allows me to be able to do things with more clarity, uh, my ability to be able to execute and, and do things over a period of time, uh, you build up stamina. So uh, that was one of the things that I changed in my world was uh, first my health and then my art, you know, so yes. I, I had a child this past year. Um, she's three months and for those nine months, I was unable to do a lot of things um, and it made me realize how much freedom I had before with my body and, and with my time. Um, and so now, now I'm able to kind of create and reset and think about how do I shift my work to include my child? You know, the work that I make now, how is that going to help her understand the world? 
I keep finding uh, myself coming back to these words like meaningful and beneficial. Like, you know, I'm a mother now. I got a lot of things to do. Like, I'm not doing it. It's not meaningful and beneficial. It's just the maintenance that is required for living, right? Like the constant maintenance of not only your own physical health or maybe the place that you're living in or, but your mind, you know, and, and checking in with honest and, and sober conversations with yourself and then thinking about your actions, right? And, and how they potentially might affect people or your words and how they affect people. And, and I think if you could start from this kind of self-reflection place and then figure out where you want to go from there and, and what actions seem natural for you, right? Like we're all not the same. We all have different talents and strengths and uh, we're here to help each other in any way we can figure it out. For me, making things has always made me feel better. Um, so as long as I can engage with making, uh, reading also, I've been doing a lot more reading than I had for a long time. I think all of that digital interaction really drove me back to, you know, scissors and glue and cutting and pasting in the real world, <laughs> which is how I started making art originally anyway. That's why I started making film was because it was like cutting and pasting. And I totally understood that from collage. When I started teaching when I was 25, I learned this term that I had never heard before that my students were using and they were talking about self-care. They used to be like, oh my God, like we need self-care. And I was like, what, what do you mean? Like you need a facial? Like, are you going to like go get your nails did? Like, what is this? Like, I mean, I was 25 and young, but these kids were like 18 and I was like, okay, like, am I that old that I don't understand? And they're like, no, like, if you're dealing with a lot of heavy content, like, you should have an outlet. And I was like, oh, yeah, that sounds reasonable. And I started thinking about that a lot. You know, like, I am working, like, at the time I was working with, um, like, women's family, executed women's families. You know, I've been talking to torture victims. I've been talking to, you know, individuals in society that have been, like, harmed by corrupt regimes. And it is, like, really intense work to do. And I guess I didn't realize that at the time, you know, I was 25 and I was like, I could keep doing this. I have the energy. It's great. And then I think I hit a wall even when I was like 26 and I was like, oh yeah, that self-care thing, like that sounds important. And that started kind of coming in for me in the form of um, wild bird rehabilitation. In your house? You have it in the house? Well, I actually, I wish you could see my basement. I have two baby owls. Um, <laughs> they're so cute. I love them. Um, yeah, I have two owls, probably I have four blue jays, two, one nut hatch, tufted titmouse, a song sparrow, eight robins, six grackles, um, 20 ducklings, two goslings. It's pretty insane. So thinking about action and all that's happened over the past year, if you could do anything, what kind of world would you like to build for the future? I am hoping to build a world that is actually good for me. I want a world that is good for everyone and equitable for everyone. I want that world. I don't think that I have the access to power and resources to make that world as a Black woman. And I recognize that. I'm not gonna spend my energy trying to fix these 500 years of white supremacist values in this country. There's a commitment to it that white folks gotta figure out. And people either wanna do something different or they don't. So my work, my practice has always focused and centered black people. And, and now this collaborative organization um, does the same. And so we're definitely like world building through this organization, but it's a it's an insular world, right? It's a world that centers black love, self-determination and wellness. For me as the artist and creator and producer, um, I am trying to provide an accessible world. 
I might be going back to my childhood again, but you know, there were times where you could, you didn't feel invited into a space. And uh, as I get older, I believe that I am clearly trying to invite people into a space. And then once they're in it, I actually maybe like exclude them from, from certain things. So there's a push and pull situation that's happening within the installations I create. I mean, I'm primarily these days focused on climate change and things like that and the work itself. But I, I, the point is, I'm beginning to realize more clearly that the point is not to tell people what is happening or what will happen, but make them feel it, make them realize that it's you know part of their own life and that it will affect them and people they love and people they care about. And it's sort of bringing more of the emotional contact and this sort of the, the, the difficulty of being able to grasp the, the enormity of everything, it's sort of like bringing that into focus. I don't know if you can bring enormity into focus, but bringing it, uh, bringing it in as a presence, I guess. And I think that's something that I'm trying to sort of trying to convey that in what I'm working on so that it's not just lecturing people on how they should be recycling more or not taking airplanes and things. Oh man, it's so crazy to think about future worlds because I think about, I'm doing right now, the project I'm working on is about all of these like, you know, politicians that then became dictators, even though they wanted to be like socialists. And I think about all of these like societies where, you know, individuals in power start by having like a great egalitarian idea and then it very quickly goes wrong and they're corrupted. And so I think the first thing that my like future idealistic society that would be perfect, if, if possible, would be that there would not be a single governing figure or a figurehead. So I think a more integrated and societal form of governing would be really important. Um, you know, more equal distribution of wealth, obviously, and thinking about gun laws warfare those are all things that are really important to me um and reparations when it comes to world types of wars it doesn't just mean here in america but across the world i feel like it sounds like a miss america answer it's a great <laughs> answer i like to see a world at peace that's what i would like to see i like to see a world where you know people get along and and, and celebrate one one another you know in a positive manner it just seems like it's taking, it's still taking generations for uh, people to really uh, come into uh, just accepting people for who they are, and and that's pretty tough sometimes. But then, then all of a sudden, you got a new group of kids that's coming up and all, and and you know, like everybody else in every generation, you know, everybody always want a better place to live and a wonderful a life to live and and communities and stuff, but I. We're getting there. I haven't really been a part of a ton of what I'd call mutual aid projects before. So I'm looking to get more involved in that, whether it's like food distribution or um, I know that there are some people in Detroit who are doing emergency preparedness workshops and skill shares. Um, because when you live in a city that has, you know, been defunded and pre public resources have been deregulated to the point where there are neighborhoods in Detroit that will regularly experience uh, going off the grid, like, you know, electricity uh, shutting off or heat shutting off in the winter. So uh, what are the tactics that we can use to take care of each other when that happens? I should say, too, that there's a really strong history of prefigurative politics in Detroit that goes back to the organizing of James and Grace Lee Boggs and, um, you know, sort of um, talking about not just what are we railing against, what are the systems that we're trying to tear down, but what's the world that we're trying to create? I, I've never been someone who does public works of art. I feel like my work is very private, very personal. Um, but I have been trying to think of ways to engage at another level. You know, I don't know if it's been a total conscious engagement with those thoughts, but it is something that I keep coming back to is like, what, what am I making now? You know, am I making the same things I was making before, or is it taking a turn? And I think my collage is definitely sort of a, going in another direction, but I, I have been curious, how can what I'm doing, you know, affect others in a more meaningful way? 
And I'm not saying that they don't sometimes already. I mean, I have really interesting conversations with complete strangers who've engaged with my work at an emotional level. And that's the most satisfying thing for me. But is there something, I guess I, I do question, is there something more I could be doing? How do we take our work to the community and to the public, which is what I saw in, in this past year in COVID, like the work had to get outside of galleries for people to see it, whether it's on their phone, whether it was in a public space. In this kind of new world that I want to build for myself and for other artists is how do, how, how do we, how do we build on that momentum and how do we create actual impact with our work? I wonder, like, what kind of truth spaces could we build for each other? Like genuine kinds of conversations. And, and there's this conversation in particular that I've been thinking about a lot lately. I, once there was, a, there was a program through PSU at, I think it was called CCI, that um, existed in a, in a like low security prison in Portland. And uh, I got to go and give an artist talk to some inmates. And then I, I was invited back to do, to go to a liberation literature meeting. And so it was like a party for like a one year anniversary of this reading group that had been meeting. And when they went around to talk about like, what did you do this week? I think I was like one of the first people to start it off. And it was very simple, very simple, you know, superficial, not a deep answer, right? Everyone else like bore their heart in a way that was like disarmingly honest and floored me and, and made me realize that the ways in which these men were communicating with each other is, is ways I'm not even capable of communicating with, with myself. And so then thinking about then how this, this kind of space or this kind of radical communication space doesn't exist in the world. I've never, I've never experienced it before this particular moment. How could we make space for that in the real world? Like, how can we actually honestly, disarmingly communicate with one another? I, I don't know. And the last question, having gone through this entire year, how do you feel now about responsiveness and responsibility. I, I, like responsibility can mean a lot of things. Yeah, it's um, exhausting to be responsive all the time. I've always felt that as an artist that I've had a responsibility to reflect or to process issues, right? Issues that were happening to me or to people around me, but just being kind of like a mirror and, and having that responsibility of that voice. To not have um, specific parameters around the uh, separation of art and life. I think my work is certainly art about life. And so there's already a very muddying, blurry line uh, between those two worlds. I think also knowing, is this my place to respond? Can I respond to this? You know, am I, am, I, am I seeing this through the right lens? Is there someone else that can respond better than I can? Knowing my place of privilege, even though I haven't always felt privileged, but knowing what that is and what that means and how I can help others um, is important, not in like a savior kind of idea but the fact that I can help open a door for someone else and make that space for them in where I am. And um, I think, I don't know, that, that weighs on me, especially working with young people, making sure that there's equity uh, is really important for me in, in the, the production studio, the gallery, you know, we're setting up an exhibition. Um, I'm, I'm very conscious of all of that. Um, I always have been it since I started teaching. Um, I, I feel very responsible in that way, um, almost parental. I know the pandemic's not over, but like to look around you and see who might need just like maybe, maybe needs a hug or a phone call or, you know, something repaired that you could easily do or, you know, somebody that hasn't worked 
in a while and might need some groceries. You, you know what I mean? Like they're simple acts of kindness that you don't need to tell anybody about. It's just between you and you. Yeah, taking care of your neighbors, watching out for them, and how you just sort of need to keep doing that even though there's not an emergency. So I, I do feel the responsibility. Part of my narrative in creating artwork is to actually tell the story of communities, celebrate the communities through art and to tell the story so those stories can be told over and over again. So once those pieces in public places and people who don't know anything about that community comes in and they see this piece of artwork, they can get a breath of what this community is all about. I feel like I'm sort of like a, a, a sort of like a historian a little bit because I'm just trying to encapsulate the community's history and all. So, yes. I, I just feel like it's my responsibility and really such a great honor and so much fun to be a part of the movement here and um, to be always constantly working in service of something that's like greater than than me. Um, and so I am reflecting a lot, though, and I'm thinking about like my next move. Um, and I think that I definitely owe a lot of that to the shakeup of the pandemic. I spent almost 10 years doing legal work now, and that's been a really rewarding experience. But I think that moving towards the next 10 years, I feel like it's really incumbent upon any of us who have the ability to, because not everyone has the privilege to, but anyone who has the ability to get involved in some way in the fight for climate justice, because it is a fight for racial justice. You know, like if we're thinking about like responsibilities in society or responsibilities to other citizens, like we all have the responsibility to take care of one another on a basic human level, which we don't do. Um, and I would say 90 plus percent of individuals in society are not responsive to, you know, the needs of others because we are also late capitalism and selfish. You know, thinking about wellness and self-care and collective care is something I've been doing a lot in the last five years, five, six years. Um, but all that became much more pronounced. And for people to go through it collectively as a society together, I think creates this opportunity to hold ourselves accountable collectively. But I also think people can be, respond in different ways, right? Like one person isn't going to respond in like 10,000 perfect ways, but maybe they have one way of responding to one issue because everyone can contribute something different to kind of like make up this larger whole. It's very clear now if you're willing to see it, you know, if your soul is of the orientation that you, that you could see a thing, maybe you didn't see it before, like it's all the oppressions have become very apparent, you know, so... It matters whether people actually um, are ready to share, share what they've got and uh, stop holding on to what they've got at the cost of everyone else's humanity and dignity. So yeah, I think there's a lot to be learned. There's a daydream that, you know, we can talk about race openly, but that's not always the case. And I think this past year, uh, we've been able to talk about really important issues. Like you said, there's a re-entry, there's a, a reopening, and it's kind of like a nice, nice way to start anew. Especially with like this rush to get everything back to normal. Like normal sucked. Like we don't need to go back to normal. We should be thinking about the ways in which we can change our lives based on the last 14 months that we experienced together, right? Like it makes me think about a lot of other ways that humans, you know, behave in a, you know, society during late capitalism when it comes to some type of traumatic event that occurs. Right? How do we all have space to explore our imagination? How do we embrace women in leadership? How do we embrace 
LGBT through communities? How do we... The United States main economy, maybe mentally and slash spiritually, is, is pleasure seeking, right? So this was like such a bummer and worlds, you know, changing and crashing for people the last 14 months. There are good things that we can take from it. I think that we're having conversations around consent that we weren't um, having as much before. And I'm truly excited in this day and time that all of a sudden public art seems to be uh, a, a big thing now. I, I kept thinking, why did everyone decide to go to film school in a pandemic? I, I don't understand. I think I've seen an infinite number of Zoom artist lectures this past year. Um, and Just because I think this, this, the effect of, of the pandemic um, isn't over. Like, it's still in the process. I feel like we don't understand anything. We don't know where we are in time. We don't know what we are. We don't know what we are to each other. And I think, you know, in the ways in which we can find, figure out how to be kind to one another and support one another and be fully present from day to day, I don't, I don't know if we can ask ourselves for any more than that. All right. Oh. Ready? Sweetie. Bye. Bye. <laughs>